Hello, my name is Brian Lawrence. In this video, I will provide some tips based on my first three months in Spain as an expat coming from the United States. My wife and I moved here around three months ago on a non-lucrative visa. Now, these tips may be helpful to any expats who plan on living in Spain for more than the 90 days that you would get with as a tourist, so one year or more. Keep in mind, this is based based on our experience. So make sure you do your own research. And I hope this helps. The agenda for this presentation is to go through looking at Spanish phone numbers, long-term rentals, Spanish bank accounts, utilities such as the internet, and then transportation. Uh, in this case, we did purchase a car. So I'll talk a little bit about that. First thing, as a disclaimer, you want to understand um, when coming to Spain is that having a fluent Spanish speaker, whether that is you or a friend or a gestor, is going to make your life much easier. The language barrier can be a showstopper. Luckily for me, my wife is fluent in Spanish. A gestor, by the way, is a private professional agent who specializes in dealing with Spanish administrative uh, bureaucracy. Uh, on behalf of the client, which is you. In short, they can really save you a lot of time if you find the right one. Next thing to understand, to get a real Spanish bank account, internet, and utilities, you will need to have a residency card or a TA. The agenda of this talk is ordered based on the need for that card. And um, this timeline shows a general idea of what you could do with or without the card. So for example, if you are from the USA, you need to have a visa to be able to stay past the 90 day tourist window. My wife and I are in Spain on a non lucrative visa. Once you have a visa, you will get a foreigner's identification number known as a NIE, which stands for Numero de Identidad de Extranjero which is again, it's just a foreigner's identification number. Your goal is to get the TA, which stands for Tarjeta de Identidad de Extranjero, basically your foreigner's identification card, also known as a residency card. Now this card is a card, a physical card, kind of like a driver's license from the States with your Spanish information and your photo on it. So it's pretty helpful because you will no longer, once you get this card, you will no longer have to carry your passport around for identification purposes. Now to get this card, you need to have what is called a Padron, which is basically your proof of address. To get that, you'll need to have a rental agreement, which why is why in this presentation I will go into long-term rentals. Now, I'm not going to be providing advice about how to go through the process of getting your TA, your visa, your Padron. That process is tricky. And also, it varies depending on where you live, uh, the, how you do it, and honestly, even the amount of time it might take varies based off of where you live. I highly suggest joining some expat Facebook groups and searching with any of the answers that you might have because any of the questions you might have because there are a lot of answers in those groups. Okay, well, let's, let's move on to the first agenda items, phone number. If you think you can just get along and use your USA-based mobile plan or Canadian plan or North American plan, guess what? You can't think again. Even if you have the money to spend on the insane monthly costs of a US phone plan, to do business in Spain, you're really just going to need a local Spanish number. The good news is that a phone plan in Spain is honestly relatively cheap compared to what you might be used to paying. And you only need a passport or a NIE to get one. To give you an idea of the cost, I pay around 10 euro, 11 euro a month for 16 gigabytes of data, which I never use, and basically unlimited calling and texting. Compare that to what you might spend in the States, it would be 10 times that amount, most likely. Uh, some advice here, before you leave for Spain, you will need to unlock your mobile phone. And also you'll need to figure out what are you going to do with your existing plan in the country that you're living in right now. So your USA number if you're from the States, 
There are several options available to you. Uh, you can continue to pay for service if you want. And this might honestly be a good idea if you are handling business matters within the states. But keep in mind, you'll be spending a lot of money to have that service. And you won't be able to really use that service here in Spain without having to spend a literal fortune. Uh, the other part of that is, like I mentioned earlier, you need to have a Spanish phone number to do business here in Spain. So what you'll need to do is get your phone unlocked. You can simply talk to your, your phone provider to figure out how to do that. And then what you'll do is you'll come here and you'll get a SIM card. And I'll go into that in just a, little, in just a minute. Uh, a couple more, some more information about what you can do in terms of like, what do you do with your number if you don't want to continue to pay for service? There's several options. Uh, Google Voice is a really good option for only 20 US dollars, one flat initial fee. You can park your number in Google Voice and we'll be able to access it forever through voice over IP. That's what I did with my phone. Unfortunately, Google Voice doesn't work for every phone number, depending on how your phone number was um, created. If it was created by a business, for example, it may not be eligible to be able to port to Google Voice. But the good news is that there are other options that will work for you. My wife, her phone number wasn't eligible for Google Voice. So we had to find an alternative and we found a service called Tossable Digits. And for a reasonable amount of year, we we're able to park her number in tossable digits. And just like I can use voice over IP for Google Voice, she also has that ability with tossable digits. So that's another option for you if you do want to keep your, your old phone number. And I would always recommend having a at least one US phone number while you're living in Spain. It will make your life easier if you're still dealing with US businesses or banks or whatever, which most likely you will have to do. All right, so let's assume you have decided to cancel your plan. You've unlocked your phone. You figure out what to do with your number. You've ported it to Google Voice or Tossable Digits, or you're just going to uh, like continue to pay for, for a plan in the States. Next thing to do is honestly just go to the mall. The first thing you should do is head to that mall, and what you'll do is you'll find that any of the stores in the mall, any of the mobile Phone stores in the mall will have the option to purchase a prepaid SIM. In the case that we found, we found this company called Libero, which was a, a, a phone mobile provider that actually uses Vodafone's network. So the network is really good. And again, for 10, 11 euros, I pay, uh, I get 16 gigabytes and it's really, really cheap. And once you do that, you literally get a SIM card. You can simply swap out your existing SIM card with that SIM card, and you're up and running in, in five minutes. A uh, little tip here, if you are an iPhone user and you use iMessage or FaceTime, you may need to add some extra euros to your prepaid SIM plan. And what that looks like is you will be able to create an account once you get the SIM card online. And then you can add some money to your account. So in, in the case of, of us, we were able to add five euros to the account. And this is important because the way iMessage and FaceTime works is they'll send you an activation text. And the way that they send it is from a country outside of Spain. And in this case, I believe it's coming from the UK. And unfortunately, your prepaid SIM will not allow external text coming from other company, countries unless there's some money. So what would happen is they would try, it would try to activate and the text wouldn't go through. So you would never, never able to activate your iMessage or your FaceTime. Um, you add that five euro and then it suddenly activates and you'll notice there's 10 cents or so deducted from, from the cost, from, you know, the five euros you put in there, but little tip. Another thing just to be aware of, if you decide in the States that you still want your plan, you want to keep either the current plan that you have or a cheaper plan, your SIM card is what connects you to the provider. So if you have a newer phone, some phones have dual SIMs. In that case, you can keep your existing U.S. or North American-based SIM card and then just add the Spanish SIM card and, and then you're good to go. You can then use your Spanish plan here in Spain. And when you go back to the States, you can switch over and use 
your US SIM if you want to do that. Again, it's more expensive, but you may want to do that if, if you're running a business or something like that. Okay, that's phone. So I'm assuming um, you have a visa that allows you to stay in Spain long term if you're watching this. Uh, long term is basically 90 days beyond 90 days. If you come here to Spain with no visa from the States, you can stay for up to 90 days as a tourist. And, and if that is the case and you're watching this, then this part you should probably just ignore. Uh, anytime you come to Spain as a tourist, you want to stay in places either through Airbnb or hostels. You would not want to try to negotiate a rental agreement. Just there's too much hassle. There's a lot that goes into it. So I would highly suggest that if you stay, you're staying in Spain as a tourist for three months or less, just go with Airbnb. Cool thing about Airbnb that a lot of, not a lot of people know is if you stay past a certain amount of days, like 30 days, I believe, you'll get a reductive um, cost for staying. It'll be a long-term cost. So it'll be like 20, 30% cheaper than if you were only staying for three days per day. Okay, so the remainder of this is really focused on this, this rental agreement discussion. It's really focused on those of you who are here in a visa who need to stay six months or longer. And also, like I mentioned earlier, you're going to need proof of address to get your TA. So you have your local phone number. First thing you should focus on is your apartment search after you get that number. Now, there's a number of ways to go about this. We heavily relied on the Spanish real estate site called Idealista. It's really a fantastic site that enables you to search rentals by location and cost, just like any other property site you might find um, in the States. We had a long list of favorites on Idealista, and, and we just basically started reaching out via WhatsApp, phone calls, and the website itself, Idealista, has a messaging system. Inter interestingly, speaking of WhatsApp, it is heavily used in Spain, even by businesses. So once you get here, if you don't have a WhatsApp account, you will need to get one because you'll find that most everybody uses it. And when I say businesses, I'm talking about um, just like general businesses, whether it's a restaurant or, for example, we have pets, our vet to make an appointment. You can use WhatsApp to, to make an appointment. So WhatsApp is a big, a big deal. And uh, also you use WhatsApp to contact potential landlords or is real estate agents um, to, to find a rental. So we started looking, we quickly got responses and we started booking visits to see places. Initially we booked around five. Uh, luckily for us, we, the third apartment we saw was exactly what we were looking for. In fact, this picture is a view from our PISO showing the neighborhood. Um, Now, we got lucky, and it can be a challenge if you don't speak Spanish, for sure. Um, and if you don't speak Spanish, again, like I mentioned earlier, you'll probably want to potentially use a Hestor that does speak sp Spanish and English so that they can do translations. Or um, if you're looking for rental apartments, places to live in more English-speaking areas, like uh, areas on the coast that might have a lot of British that's an option as well. One word of caution, if you find that the person you are dealing with, the potential landlord, isn't really being honest or forthcoming, listen to your gut and keep looking until you found someone you can trust. I have seen some serious challenges, and if your landlord isn't trustworthy, well, you're going to have a rough time. Uh, you're going to be stuck with them for a while, so just if, if you're starting to feel like it's not right, it's not right. Keep looking. Keep looking. As a foreigner, you're also going to have to prove that you have the money to pay for the duration of your lease. And this might be a challenge. You have to prove that you have financial solvency. Some ways that you can do this, depending on the owner of the place that you're interested in, is showing any income that you might have from the states, whether that's a pension or money in the bank or whatever. You could do that. And um, Unfortunately, that might not be enough for some owners. Some of them may request that you just pay out of pocket immediately for six or even up to 12 months in advance. This happens. 
So the only piece of advice I would have for you is expect that that might be something you might have to do when you come here. Uh, yeah, if you don't have a Spanish job, there's that's that just might be an option for you. So something to think about. It can be a pain. And uh, the other thing I'll mention that it will vary greatly by the owner that you're dealing with, the landlord that you're dealing with. In our situation, we got lucky. Our landlord didn't require that we did that. And we were able to just put down two months and we were able to get in. It really is entirely up to them as an owner. There is no set rule that they have to follow. Another thing I would mention is that there are reasons for landlords here in Spain to think that way because the government really is on the side of the renter. So if you as a renter get into a place and you decide that you're just going to stop paying your rent or you want to like rearrange or destroy things, unfortunately for your landlord, they don't have um, a lot of options. And it's going to be very difficult for them to kick you out based off of the, the legal system here. So they have reasons to be that way. All right. Well, that's that's enough about rentals. Let's move on to banks. Getting a Spanish bank account with a Spanish IBAN is essential if you will be staying in Spain longer term. The primary reason for this is that you most likely will need a Spanish bank account with that IBAN to pay for utility, utilities, such as electricity, internet, and water. Another reason that you want to think about is that sometimes your non-Spanish bank card won't work. I have found that my US-based credit cards and bank cards do work 99% of the time here. But there are situations where occasionally it just, just doesn't work. For example, I attend a local Spanish school here to learn Spanish, and their online payment system just won't accept my non-Spanish credit card for some reason. Finally, if you are here in Spain on a visa, such as like a non-lucrative visa, having a minimum amount of money in your bank account consistently can also help with renewal. So it's another reason why you might want to have a Spanish bank account. All right, in this section, I'm going to provide some insight into our journey with creating that Spanish bank account. All right, <clears throat> within the first month before we had our TA, we spent some time visiting and, and evaluating various banks looking to open up checking accounts. The table here shows our results. Keep in mind, this is again what we found from visiting each of these banks and applying in person for a checking account. This might have changed by the time you're watching this. It's also possible that depending on who you talk to at the bank might change um, might change, might be different from another person at the bank. It's just the way it is. But this should give you a general idea. So we'll take a look at each. Uh, a banca. This is a larger bank here in Spain. And honestly, there's just no way to get an account without a TA. And even with a TA, once you have that residency card, they, a banca, wanted to have a, you to have a Spanish job. So this was an absolute no-go for us. Now, uh, on the bright side, when we walked into the office for Ibanka, it honestly was just a mess. It seemed like they were living in the 90s, and uh, you just didn't get a good feeling. So I would say Ibanka, don't even waste your time with them. They're not going to be helpful to foreigners. Bank Inter. This is a, definitely a more modern bank. And yes, you can get an account without having a TA, so you can get one with your NIA. However, uh, non-resident accounts are, are fairly expensive. They have some fairly expensive fees. And even after that, they had some fees as well. Uh, they weren't as expensive as a non-resident, but they were still fairly expensive. Uh, Deutsche Bank, they do not provide accounts to anyone without a TA. However, this bank will provide an account after that and depending on how much you transfer into that account a month, you could avoid maintenance fees. 
However, we did see that they also charge for international transfer. So that's another thing you might want to take a look at as you're exploring banks. Sabadell. So this is another bank like Bank Inter that will provide an account if you don't have a TA. But this is similar in that there will be fees with the out the TA, there'll be fees with the TA. And I, I believe Sabadell, when we were talking to them, they had exceptions. Uh, but those exceptions for, for basically free accounts were like having an investment account with them or other types of uh, programs that they had available. So again, this really wasn't a good option for us. ING. Now, ING, they do not provide accounts to anyone without a TA. However, similar to Deutsche Bank, they may have some very low fees or reduced fees or potentially free accounts if you bring in enough money to your account once a month, that type of thing. I will say that ING is a very modern bank and has a real good reputation. So this, this bank should be considered, when we walked into ING, for example, uh, very modern, there was a lot of organization. As soon as we walked in, we didn't even have to wait in line. Uh, one of the bank bank people who were there walked up to us and asked us what we were there for. They obviously noticed we were foreign and they explained that without a non-resident account or non-resident card, um, without a TA, without a resident card, we wouldn't be able to open accounts. So we were only there for five minutes, but ING seems like a good place. So I would, I would recommend checking them out. All right, finally, last two here, BBVA. They provide accounts to non-residents and residents. If you have your TA, you can actually create an, a free online account with no fees. Uh, this is the bank we went for, for our long-term needs. Uh, if you don't have your TA yet, you can open an account with an EA, but it'll cost you some money. So BBVA is, is potentially a, a good way to go. It's a modern bank. Again, they have that online account with no fees. Finally, N26. So N26, this is a really good bank to get into as soon as you get into Spain because you can open an account for free with no fees with your NIA without having that TA, without having that residency. Uh, N26 will then get you that Spanish IBON, which you can then use for utilities. Although I have heard that depending on the utilities, uh, sometimes they have a problem with N26 because it's a newer bank. I believe N26 is out of Germany. Uh, and uh, they've had challenges in the past. N26 also potentially has challenges when it comes to Spanish government and the Hacienda or the taxes. Currently, at least as of the recording of this presentation, and you can't pay taxes in Spain with N26, although this might change in the future. Bottom line, our approach here was to get an account as soon as possible and we were able to do that in the n26 with no fees and then once we got our ta we went to bbva because that's a more established bank and you won't have any problems with utilities or the government with bbva that is our uh, adventure with spanish banks okay finally let's move on to not finally but we're going to move on to utilities next so utilities once you have that Spanish IBON bank, you can now go ahead and sign up for getting yourself internet and utilities if required. Quick note that depending on where you live, you may or may not need to deal directly with the utility company. For example, some landlords allow you to just pay them directly and they will pay your utilities. Uh, you will need to make sure again that you have that level of trust that with that landlord and Honestly, with our landlord right now, we don't have to directly pay the electric company. What happens is our landlord takes a picture of the bill, sends it to us, and then we just include the payment for that bill in our monthly rent. So that, that is an option and that does happen pretty commonly here in Spain. Regardless, we have to pay internet. You will most likely have to pay some type of utility directly. So for this, this part of this presentation, I'm just going to mention and focus on the internet. So another um, nice surprise here is that internet, at least, is far cheaper here in Spain than it is in the States. All of the major players, such as Movistar, Digi, PTV, Vodafone, or Orange, 
uh, generally provide up to one gig up and down for the low cost of around 30-ish euros, which honestly is insane to me. A piece of advice is to find out what service provider your rental unit had in the past. That way you will not have to worry about having any external setup, um, which generally external setup wouldn't have to cost you anything, but it might take time. For us, we went with PTV because PTV was in this unit. And we were, again, able to get 30, get one gig up and down for only 30 euros a month, which also included cable channels for a year. Typically, you'll find that they also have bundles, just like you would find in other countries or in the States. Uh, you can purchase internet, and typically they can bundle phone, mobile service as well. And for the most part, all the prices are the same. So for us, we pay about around 30 euro for our internet, and we still have Libera because we just it was easy to use, but we pay about 10 euro each. So you're looking at 50 euro for super fast internet and two phones with plenty of data a month. You compare that to what you might have paid in the past in the States, and it is quite different. I uh, remember back in the States for internet and cable, you're looking at like 180 dollars a month and then we had back then we had three phones in the states and that was around 140 dollars so you're looking at over 300 dollars compare that to 50 euros a month it's quite refreshing another thing i, I just wanted to mention now if you if you have your your ta already you should be in all of the systems that the utility and internet company need you to be in to be able to provide that internet, that service to you. Now, when we uh, when we went to get our internet, it was shortly after we found the rental. We did not yet have our residency card. Our TA just wasn't done yet. And because of that, our NEA wasn't in all of the systems that were required by the utility company, uh, which made it a little difficult because we could not get internet until they got that into the system. Now, sometimes the utility companies can help you with that. For example, our internet provider said they would help get our number in the system, but again, it's gonna take time. Luckily for us, we were also purchasing a car at the same time and we were using a HES store and we were able to just go to the HES store and have them get our NEA in the right systems for around 25 euro. Uh, they they can do a lot because they have access to things that you don't have access. So again, just mention that HES store. All right, this picture here is just a picture of my, uh, my happy place, my nerd cave, as I like to call it. Okay, first question you should ask yourself is, um, when it comes to transportation in Spain, is do you actually need a car? Do you need to have a coche? If you decide to live in some of the larger cities like Madrid or Barcelona, Sevilla, or Malaga, the public transportation is just fantastic. In Malaga, our piso is five minutes from the bus and also five minutes from the metro, which makes having a car here a nice to have, but not really a necessity. That being said, we decided to purchase a car because we wanted to explore those areas that are not as well connected. So like if you want to go visit those whitewashed villages in the mountains or you want to go hike in some of the hiking trails around the areas or just find some of those attractions that are just not part of major cities, it's harder to get there, but not impossible without a car. For us, we decided we needed a car. So we uh, started exploring when we got here. We started our search in Facebook and we found a nice couple who just purchased a new vehicle and wanted to sell their car. We met the couple, we did a test drive and we decided to move forward with the sale. The couple told us that they always use a Hess store for private sales. So we went with that and uh, that was a good decision in, in total for the cost of the pest store, the government fees, taxes, all that. It was, I believe, less than 200 euro. So we got our car. All good, right? Well, not so fast. In Spain, used cars must go through an inspection once a year called the ITV. 
Uh, this is very similar to what you would expect in the States. Depending on what state you live in, you will probably have to get a state inspection um, once a year or some some period of time. In Pennsylvania, where we lived, it was once a year. Um, in Spain, having to go through this test will really depend on the age of the car. So cars under four years of age don't need to have an ITV test at all. Cars between four and 10 years old are tested every two years, and cars that are older than 10 years are subjected to an, an ITV test annually. So if you're looking for a car from a private seller, just make sure you know when the ITV test is due. <laughs> Shortly after the sale, we found out the test was due the following week. Now they did tell us that the test was coming out, but I just didn't connect the dots and I didn't think much about it, probably because we wanted to buy that car right away. It's just something you just didn't think about. But that added a little bit of stress once we realized this test was due within a week. So we asked around and we found out that you can take your car to an auto mechanic and they will do a pre-ITV inspection to make sure you are ready to go when you bring your car to the ITV inspection station. Now, again, that's another difference. I think some states are like this, but in Pennsylvania, you would just have to take your car to a mechanic and they can do the inspection right from there. Uh, they get qualified, certified, whatever, they can do it. Here in Spain, there are inspection stations and you have to schedule your, you have to make the, you have to make the appointment online and then you can take your car in and, and the only thing they do is the inspection. They're not going to fix it. So you either pass or fail. And if you fail, you have a certain amount of time to get the car fixed. Smart thing to do though, is to go to a mechanic first and have them do the inspection, make sure that they uh, can fix anything that will fail. So we did that. We found a good mechanic, thanks to our awesome landlord again, and it turned out that the car needed a lot of work. Uh, so we had to do it. In fact, we ended up spending more money on the repairs than we did for the purchasing of the car. But at the end of the day, um, we were able to get through that inspection uh, without a problem after we put some money into the car. And, and yeah, now we have a nice car. You can see the picture here. That's our old, uh, we call it the green machine. It's an older car, Peugeot, it's, it's you know, it's, it's cheap. We wanted to make sure we had a cheap car because if you, when you come to Spain, you'll notice that the parking spots are much smaller, roads are smaller depending on where you're driving. And it's just different. So having a small car that you can ding up, a beater, if you will, is, is a good way to go. Um, my tips for you, so if we knew this before we went through this process, what I would have done is find a good mechanic. Work, you want to do a private sale, it's fine. Find a good mechanic, bring the mechanic with you to look at the car before you purchase it, and make sure the IVT, ITV isn't due in two weeks. Uh, make sure that you have some time. Ideally, they, you, know, you buy a car right after they get the ITV inspection done, so you have a full year. I mean, that's something that you might find happening quite a bit in the States if you know what you're doing. Now, if you decide to purchase not through private, through a dealer, I have no idea. I would love to hear about it. So if you've done that with a dealer and you have any tips or suggestions for us, feel free to put them in the comments. That would be, would be great to share to share your experience. This is we wanted a cheap car and you know dealing with private is the best way to get a cheap car although sometimes you have to pay in other ways okay so to summarize the key points we talked about a phone number make sure before you come here to spain you unlock your phone you figure out what you're going to do with your with your current service and then when you get here just go to the mall get that cheap prepaid sim swap your sim and you're good to go rentals uh, best thing to do is to utilize Idealista. Like I said, have someone who speaks Spanish, whether that's you or Hestor. And honestly, this requires a little bit of luck and some hard work. And hopefully you'll be able to, to land a deal in a nice place here, get a, that rental agreement. Uh, Spanish bank accounts, you will need one. N26 is the way to go. I have heard that N26 currently has a wait list. So hopefully when you're watching this, and that is no longer the case, but N26 and BBVA are my suggestions. Internet, it's cheap and it's fast. Uh, so just be happy about that. <laughs> and that's one, one good point about being here in Spain. And then finally, the last tip is car. If you decide to purchase a car through a private 
buyer, make sh private seller, make sure you bring a mechanic along and you understand when that ITV is. So thanks so much for watching and making it to the end. I know this is a, a longer video, but there's just a lot of content, a lot of things we found out about, and I wanted to share that with you. Now, if you like this video and you're interested in expat living in Spain, feel free to subscribe as I learn more. Uh, I plan on putting some more videos out. Um, I also put some videos out about cooking once in a while and potentially some technology stuff in the future. But other thing to note here is that if you're deciding to come to Spain, I would highly recommend you join some Facebook groups. There's a lot of really good groups out there. The community in these groups are really good most of the time. And if you have some questions, they should be able to answer those questions. We, I'm, I'm personally a member of all the groups here, American expats in Spain, American expatriates in Spain, American in Spain, expats in Malaga. So I live in Malaga, but if you're you know, going to Madrid or Sevilla or Barcelona, or any other place, I'm sure that they have expats in that place. So I would highly recommend subscribing. Uh, finally, here's some references. A lot of the images I use in this in this talk are from unsplash.com. So if you're ever looking for, if you ever need to create a good presentation and you want some good images, feel free to go to Unsplash and you can find some really good, good images. But again, thanks for watching. I appreciate it and you have a great day. Bye.